it's wonderful to have everybody here and we're looking out in the pit. There are a number of people that are also here that are going down to the tables and on your way out, be sure that you go. You can get your free uh, sample of Mosquito Off, uh, the one that everybody's recommending. But I, I'm just so pleased to see everyone here and so thank you. We have a wonderful group of people here to talk a bit about uh, Zika virus and it's an important uh, it, it's an important topic. I know it's in the news a lot. It's going to continue to be in the news, and it seemed like this was a really good time for this kind of event. Zika itself was actually discovered more than 50 years ago, but it is, it, it was discovered or first found in Uganda, but of course it's the latest example of what we would call an insect-borne emerging or infectious disease. We don't know a lot. There's still a lot to be known about Zika. Um, we know that it's recently spreading. The leak, we know about the link you've all read to microcephaly, uh, to rare neurological disorder, which inf infects infants, really took this virus and put it into the headlines. Of course, it's getting a lot of coverage because in August we have the Rio uh, Olympics and more than 10,000 Olympic athletes. That's a big number too. 10,000 athletes and trainers uh, go and more than a million spectators are gonna be drawn to that big event in Brazil during this time of the Zika outbreak. So that too is intensifying the interest and the scrutiny. The WHO says right now that about 1.5 million people have been infected by Zika in Brazil. Uh, and it's been reported currently in 62 different countries and territories, and they do say that 75% of the people who are infected with Zika do not show any symptoms. So this is, a, this is a, an example of what we see in a very globalized world. And so at a university like Chapel Hill that sits right here in a region with a lot of people who travel, a lot of young people who are going around the world who might be at an age when this is a particularly important uh, disease, especially if it affects pregnancies, um, we find out things about Zika that make it important that we want to give people the right information, not information to over scare you or, or create a situation that isn't true, but to give people as much information as possible. So I'm just really pleased we have a great panel of people that I'm going to introduce in a moment. You know, this came about very quickly. I think it was something near the end of May. It really was, I called up Mike Cohen as I always do when there's an infectious disease in the news. I do, I really call them up. I say, Mike, what do you know about this? What do we know about this? What should we be doing? Mike was fantastic. He immediately co contacted Dr. Megan Davies and Evelyn Faust with the North Carolina DHHS. They came over, we had a meeting. We started talking about it and, and decided that it would be great if we could come up with an event that we could bring together people to talk about it. And they did it in less than a month, I'm just, or about a month, I'm so pleased and so grateful to everybody that would come together and do something like that. So really appreciate that. And we thought, well, to make it even better, we'd throw in ice cream. So afterwards, you'll get to stop by and, and ask questions, but have a chance to have some ice cream. And the sun decided to be our friend today, so that's great. I think uh, we have some members I'd like to mention. I think uh, Chapel Hill Mayor Pam Hemminger is here. Oh, there she is sitting right in front of me. Hi, Pam, thank you. Uh, we also have Liska Lackey, the chair of the uh, Orange County Board of Health. Liska, thank you. Thank you for being here. Jerry Wagner, the Hillsborough Fire Marshal and Emergency Coordinator. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And I'm sure there are many other people here that I just don't have your names, but thank you all for being here. Uh, we have, you know, we, we have a university that has a number of outstanding infectious disease specialists, virologists, global leaders. And um, there are more than 10, this is interesting, there are more than 10 groups right now who are working to understand the biology and transmission of the Zika virus. You know, the School of Medicine here has a history of this study of infectious diseases. And so it's it, when you have groups like that, they go to the, any emerging disease, they imme immediately start deploying their resources to really get involved in it. So they act quickly part of a network of people across the nation and the world that do start moving as fast as they possibly can. So they're already working with state and federal officials, including the CDC and the NIH. We internally funded three pilot grants uh, that would research Zika diagnostics in particular, transmission, uh, associated neurological disorders, 
because we wanted to study and get going the early stage research that would be relevant to NIH, but you don't really have the time to wait for a whole funding cycle, write a grant, write it, get in there, you know, that some of those things, many of you know, take a long time. So we need to be able to deploy these rapid response, early responders that are definitely collaborative with state and federal agencies. It's really an example of how these, these groups need to work together. One of the other things you need to understand a little bit more is the ecology of mosquitoes. That's a little bit more in my own area of research, uh, and I think it's quite fascinating because these diseases are carried sometimes by a very specific vector, a very specific species, and so you need to understand their movement to really understand where you're going to have these outbreaks. And that's also how you can often prevent the disease, is to stop it via the transmission of mosquitoes. So some of the things you're going to hear about today are ways to protect yourselves from mosquitoes and some ways that you can protect your community from the hatching of many mosquitoes. So I think that's another important part of this. It's estimated that 95 to 99 percent of worldwide cases of Zika are transmitted by mosquitoes. But another piece of Zika that is, is pretty different and alarming to people, something we need to understand, is that it's also transmitted sexually. And that is very different from other uh, mosquito-borne diseases, and it's something people are really trying to understand. And, and it also carries, as I said, these birth defects, and so those are particularly uh, important to people thinking about Zika. It's in the U.S., we do know that. There are no, no known U.S. cases that have been attributed to a direct a bite of a mosquito in the United States, so these are mostly people who have been infected and are coming to the United States, but they could also be transmitted sexually within the United States. But its problem is complicated, but people believe it's highly solvable. So I think that's one of the other things to take away. We don't despair, we get acting. And that's what we're really trying to do, is give you some ways that you can feel that you can act and can be very helpful. So really excited to have you here. And now I'm going to turn it over to the experts who really know. They just gave me a chance to sound a little bit like a scientist, because it's always fun for me to get to do that. But, uh, and I am one, but not in this area. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Colleen Bridger, who's the Orange County Health Director. And uh, her talk's going to be top five things you need to know about Zika. Then we have Dr. Ar Arvinda De Silva, who's the professor of microbiology and immunology in the School of Medicine, talking about an overview of the epidemiology of Zika and the research that this university is actually doing in it. And then we'll have Dr. Randa Williams, who's the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, uh, to talk to you. And he's going to talk about what's being done right here in North Carolina to prepare for and respond to Zika. Dr. Bridger, thank you. So good afternoon. I'm here to speak just five minutes on the top five ways to um, prevent Zika infection. So I was told if I just hit that button, it'll move forward. So number one, avoid area, uh, travel to areas known to have Zika. Um, if you're not sure where that is, you can go to the CDC's website and um, they update that on a regular basis. Um, just to reiterate, there is no local transmis transmission yet of the Zika virus, um, though many people believe that it is just a matter of time. The, all right, it worked well the first time. All right, number two, um, avoid unprotected sex with men who have traveled to areas known to have Zika. Again, it's important to remember that most Zika cases are asymptomatic. Um, and that men who have the Zika infection can be contagious before they develop symptoms, while they are symptomatic, and for a long time after they have been infected. Um, we know that the virus lasts longer in semen than in blood. We're not exactly sure how long, but we're figuring that out. Um, and as was mentioned, we're especially concerned about pregnant women or women who could become pregnant because of the uh, risk of microcephaly. The third thing you can do to avoid Zika is to avoid mosquito bites. Um, and it's important to understand that many of the states in the US, including North Carolina, have the right kind of mosquito um, to transmit the Zika virus. Um, they are daytime biters, so I know a lot of us are used to being told to avoid you know, dawn and dust because that's when most mosquitoes bite. With this particular mosquito, it is um, a daytime biter. 
Um, and if you're young enough to have really good eyes and young enough to have really quick reflexes, you might notice that they have striped legs. I myself don't wait that long before trying to whack them, but um, we do highly recommend using bug spray and making sure that it does have DEET. Um, and wearing long sleeves and pants are the best ways to avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes. So the fourth way is to mosquito-proof your home and your yard. Um, that means once a week going through your yard and dumping out standing water and flower pots and bird baths and toys. And we've had an exceedingly wet couple of weeks, and so I actually do it every couple of days. Um, and we are recommending the use of mosquito dunks. If you have something like I have a really big bird bath that's uh, cement and it's heavy and hard for me to dump it out, um, you can get mosquito dunks that um, will kill the larva before they emerge as mosquitoes and put that in some of the larger areas that it's harder to dump out. Um, make sure that your screens on your doors and windows are intact and make sure that you're using them um, not leaving doors or windows wide open because, like I said, these mosquitoes are active in the daytime. They like to go into the house um, and find their meals. And then fifth, um, if you have had Zika, avoid mosquitoes because that's how we're able to stop the transmission of the virus um, to other people. So um, if you have had the Zika virus, make sure that you stay away from mosquitoes for the week that you are sick um, because a mosquito can bite you, become infected, and then bite somebody else. So that is the end of my um, talk, and I don't know who's next, so let's see. Uh, uh, all right, <laughs> Dr. De Silva will be next. Thank you for organizing this event uh, to let our community know about what's going on at UNC about Zika. Um, I want to start off by saying that, uh, sort of reiterating something that Chancellor Ford uh, mentioned, even before Zika came on the scene, um, this campus in particular has really a remarkable history of working on these mosquito-borne viruses, uh, dengue, eastern equine encephalitis virus, chikungunya, Ross River, uh, so we really have world experts working on these viruses and we have been working for many years on these viruses and really doing work that has global implications way beyond our local community. So it was logical that when Zika came on the scene that, uh, that, that many of the research programs here started to focus on, on this virus as well. So, so what I want to do is to spend a few minutes talking about um, how Zika in many ways is very similar to many of these other emerging arboviruses as well as some of the critical differences and then to, to give you all a sense of the, the work that's going on across this campus and also ways in which uh, you might be able to participate actually in some of the, the research that's going on um, at Carolina. Um, so it's actually not surprising that Zika emerged and, uh, and is spreading all over Central and South America. The, the ecology of, of Zika is very similar to dengue to yellow fever. So these are viruses that are spread by mainly by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, and they actually use humans as their main vertebrate host. So given that the ecology of Zika is very similar to dengue and yellow fever, and, and yellow fever dengue are viruses in Central and South America that have been introduced from Africa and parts of Asia, it is not surprising that Zika also made that trip and is thriving in, in that hemisphere because the ecology is very similar to other viruses that are um, that have been thriving for quite a while. Um, the, uh, from a diagnostic point of view, this is complicated because, because these viruses are, so, uh, viruses are so similar, it's very difficult to, uh, by laboratory assays, to say whether someone has had dengue or Zika. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that challenge and some of the research that's going on here at Carolina. Um, um, there have been many imported US cases. There have also been locally acquired cases, but uh, through sexual transmission, but not by mosquito bite. Um, I'm, many of you may not know this, but there has been local transmission of dengue um, in parts of southern Florida, southern Texas. Um, so while it's very unlikely this virus is going to spread all over the U.S. because the ecology is not right, but in some of the southern states, mainly Texas and Florida, the main vector, Aedes aegypti, is present in lower densities, nothing like the densities you find in other parts of the world. 
and there has been um, local uh, transmission of dengue. So um, it would not be surprising if you get some local transmission of Zika in those areas as well. What's really the reason I think we're all here is this really unusual um, findings with Zika, the fact that, uh, that it can actually cross the placenta. That's unprecedented for these mosquito-borne viruses. And, and Zika really seems to do this quite frequently in, in a, during early stages of pregnancy to cross the placenta and infect the fetus. And that's really why this is such an urgent global health priority. The second thing is this virus seems to go to parts of the body that's different from some of the other related viruses. The fact that you actually don't find as much virus in the blood as some of these other related viruses, but this virus is found in high concentrations in urine and in semen, and the issue of sexual transmission is also completely unprecedented. And those are really um, unique aspects of Zika that, uh, that need to be studied. Um, so some of the key questions and, and the work that's going on here at Chapel Hill, one has to do with something that's you know, not that groundbreaking, but it's diagnostics. Before you can study and control a virus, you need to be able to figure out who has the virus. And this is a real challenge. So um, in areas where Zika is, trans, uh, is uh, spreading now in, in South America, um, cl close to 80 to 90% of the adults have already been infected with dengue. That's how common dengue is in, in areas of uh, where Zika has been transmitted. And the fact that we can't differentiate dengue from Zika is a big problem, right? So, the, and, and a major priority right now is to come up with appropriate tests for distinguishing Zika from other flaviviruses. So, um, and, and this is an area where there's a lot of expertise on that, this campus, and both with support from um, NIH and as well as internal prompts from UNC, there's teams of people here on um, in Chapel Hill. My pointer is not working, but my group, Dr. Barrick in the School of Public Health, um, Dr. Collins from uh, Department of Medicine, um, as well as Dr. Miley from the School of uh, Pharmacy. We are all, uh, Department of Pharmacology, we are all working very hard to um, come up with uh, diagnostic assays for really finding out whether someone has uh, Zika and, and it's not just cross-reactivity to dengue. And, and we're doing this in partnership with the, the North Carolina State Health Department is also developing assays with uh, guidelines from CDC and we are working in partnership with them, the clinical labs at UNC, as well as the CDC. The, the second area is prevention, and, and we've heard about some of the ways of being prevented, uh, being uh, protecting yourself by avoiding mosquitoes or preventing the breeding of mosquitoes, but really a long-term solution is the development of a vaccine. And, and as Chancellor Fowl said, this is a solvable problem. There are excellent vaccines, the yellow fever vaccine, the Japanese encephalitis vaccine against related viruses. So there's all the uh, possibilities of making a good Zika vaccine. Okay, so, and, Again, this is an area where at UNC we've been working for years on dengue vaccines. We are now partnering with all three major pharmaceutical companies that are doing clinical trials on dengue vaccines. So there's a lot of both expertise, both on the front of basic research and uh, uh, translational research on making vaccines against this group of viruses. And here on campus, um, what we are doing is um, a program that's headed by uh, Dr. Jenny Ting in, in genetics and includes um, Dr. Jody Simone and his group in the Department of Chemistry, they've developed these novel nanoparticles for delivering vaccines. We've been using these platforms for making dengue vaccines. And we are now also have support from the government for uh, using this platform to develop Zika vaccines. And we are using a lot of uh, information we have from our studies with dengue to also develop Zika vaccines. Just one thing I want to emphasize here is the nanoparticle platform. This has really come out of UNC uh, research. It's the basis of a large you know, a company in, in the triangle, Liquidia Pharmaceuticals. Um, especially in the context of Zika, this is an appropriate platform for vaccine delivery because all the leading vaccines against other related viruses in this group are live replicating viruses. And you couldn't use such a vaccine in pregnant women or people who are likely to get pregnant. So there's really a need for looking at uh, non-replicating, non-live vaccines like the nanoparticle platforms that, are, that have been developed here. Um, and the third area is really the pathogenesis. That is, why does this virus cross the placenta so easily? Well, how is it sexually transmitted? How is it causing these birth defects? And there's a lot of work going on in that area as well. And these studies are being done by Dr. Helen Lucia, who's a new faculty member who came here 
about um, a year ago. She's one of the few people who actually studied Zika even before it caused these large epidemics in, um, in um, and, and before we appreciated the microcephaly connections. Um, and along with Dr. Lezier, Dr. Barrick, and Dr. Stringer, so Jeff and Elizabeth Stringer, who are in the obstetrics and gynecology department, experts in doing maternal fetal medicine. There's really a great team here um, uh, looking at pathogenesis in the context of uh, uh, placental transmission and, and sexual transmission. Um, Dr. Cohen is also involved in these studies, given his expertise in looking at sexual transmission. And, and a lot of this work is ongoing here at Chapel Hill, as well as um, a result of um, a field sites that this university has invested in uh, in Nicaragua. There's a vibrant program, and we are working in both in Nicaragua, Colombia, as well as locally here on, on questions around pathogenesis. And so finally, how can you participate and help in these research efforts? So for a long time, as, as the chancellor said, you know, we are a global community. We have people coming here from all over the world. We have people from here going to different parts of the world. And for the last almost 10 years, we've had studies where we've been studying travelers in this community who have gotten infected with dengue. You might be surprised to know this, but we've identified over 100 people here who have traveled and come back with dengue. And, and so they're healthy, but they've had past exposures to dengue. And, they're a really valuable resource, and we have protocols that are approved by the UNCIRB for studying these travelers. Um, and we've expanded this protocol now also to look for cases of Zika, and we've already identified um, six cases of Zika in our local community. They're all fine, uh, but they're all people who traveled to Brazil or Colombia or Nicaragua and got infected. And so um, here's information, and the study is really coordinated by Dr. Matt Collins. He's an infectious disease specialist in my group, and if any of you all are um, suspect that you might have been exposed or have concerns, I urge you to, here's the contact information. I also have some flyers. And essentially what we do for this study is um, uh, we would collect your blood if you consent and do some research assays, but at the same time we would also put you in touch with the State Health Department and the CDC so that you also get the, the, the recommended testing that the, that's been set by the CDC. And at the, if you're interested, I can give you some flyers if uh, any people here are interested or want to circulate the flyers. Okay, so finally the funding. Um, there's, as you know, there's a big debate right now in uh, Congress about trying to get enough funds for Zika research, but uh, the NIH has been quite uh, um, um, flexible and, and already allocated some funds for us to start studies. These are small grants to get these programs moving, and we are especially thankful for the School of Medicine that, uh, as the Chancellor said, that just recently came up with the money to support uh, pilot grants. Um, and, and to look at some of these, get studies started on some of these critical questions. Thank you. Chancellor Folt, you're very gracious to let us come over today. As I travel around the state, and I've been to almost all 100 counties in the last year, Colleen makes me do that because she is president of the uh, local health directors for the state of North Carolina, does a phenomenal job. I often quote Chancellor Folt, but I usually make people think I thought of it. But since she's in the audience today, I better give attribution, which is, as a state of North Carolina, which is the ninth largest state, faces these issues, we think that the great public research universities, it's so vital that we partner with them. And that's clearly uh, what we're doing with this issue. Uh, since uh, I also want to take a moment to extol the virtues of a, a liberal arts education. I was a history zoology major here, and I use both of those. And we also use teamwork, which I think comes from a liberal arts education, also critical thinking, which is very much something we have to use in an emerging issue like this. But since we're in an academic setting, we're going to ask a question. I was in a room with Congressman Price about a month ago, and there were probably 5,000 uh, degrees in there. Uh, uh, but um, who is the youngest graduate of the University of Virginia Medical School? Graduated in 1867, a North Carolinian, graduated at age 17, and is still the youngest graduate of the University of Virginia Medical School. I'll give you a hint. I'm here talking about Zika. He's from Murfreesboro, North Carolina, and where Secretary Brazier and I were three weeks ago up in Hertford County. That's good. This, this puts me in a very awkward position. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, anybody want to guess? He was the founder of public health in this country and epidemiology, Dr. Walter Reed, who made uh, epidemiology and public health uh, a, a science in this country around uh, yellow fever. And uh, uh, was not born in North Carolina, but did the second best thing you can do. He married someone from North Carolina. So with that said, 
So let me just tell you what we're doing in North Carolina. January 15th, the CDC made it a uh, travel advisory on January 1st. Am I hitting the right button here? Yeah. January 1st, uh, February 1st, we made a reportable disease in North Carolina. On February 22nd, we had our first case. All travel acquired. We've now had 19 cases in North Carolina. Our first concentration was on pregnant women. I'm an obstetrician. And again, one of our great concerns was, was that uh, since it was February, we didn't think we'd see disease then, but we certainly knew that there was a possibility coming in the su summer. So initially, uh, worked with our 1,700 obstetricians, concerned about our 175,000 women who get pregnant in North Carolina every year. And uh, we rapidly developed within North Carolina the ability to do the test. It was taking six weeks to come back. As you can imagine, if you're 18 weeks pregnant and you come back from Brazil and you have the 20% are symptomatic and your doctor says well, we're going to do a test to see if you have a birth defect, it'll be back in six weeks at 24 weeks, just how much angst that would cause. So working with Chapel Hill and others, we have developed the test, very proud of that, so we get it back in six days now. We can tell you whether or not you've had the virus or whether you have the antibody of the virus in six days in our own state lab. The, the mnemonic I kind of keep is, is that the incubation is five days, you're usually symptomatic five days, and it goes away out of your bloodstream in about five days. So that's just how I remember that. So we've certainly looked at the epidemiology. We always work with our partners, the University of North Carolina, the federal government. We all attended with 21 other states, the Zika Action Summit in um, uh, uh, Atlanta, the CDC, with Dr. Frieden. And uh, again, just looking very quickly, uh, in North Carolina now, I guess we have 18 cases, excuse me, uh, but we still uh, uh, do not have any vector-borne disease in the continental United States, but are certainly seeing it in other places. Uh, again, we're at, we were in Atlanta on April 1st with 21 other states, and so, uh, and again, um, have, have worked very diligently on our um, uh, reporting, and uh, again, worked very closely with Kate Menard and other here's at Chapel Hill to make sure that we have a good uh, system for those, if someone does get pregnant and has it in uh, North Carolina. Um, I would just close by saying that what we're doing now is we're not waiting on any funding. Uh, we use resources within public health because that's what we do. We're always faced with emerging threats, and so we are uh, working with uh, Western Carolina, Eastern Carolina, and North Carolina State, working with their entomologists who know the area well to look at Aedes aegypti mosquito, the main carrier. It's been around in the United States since the 1600s. It's been much really crowded out by Albopictus, uh, which is good because it doesn't tend to be the carrier that uh, Aedes aegypti is. Uh, we are now looking at 17 counties to see where we have these mosquitoes. Uh, as you may know with this mosquito, um, that the real way to prevent it is what we call tip and toss, as Colleen was saying. And I'll leave with that. It's my understanding you have a water source here, a well. Is that correct? It was, you know, it was called the new well when I was here. I think y'all change the name, which probably shows my age, but um, I would encourage you, especially students, if you will recirculate that water frequently, that's the kind of thing we like to do. So that's your homework, and thank you so much for having us. Our three experts are willing to answer some questions if there are a few minutes of questions from people in the audience. I was told to use a lot of this, <laughs> but any advice that I want to give you, you, are, you have traveled already or traveling? So You're ready to travel. Okay, in this month, first of August. So I certainly recommend you know, daytime feeding mosquitoes, so things like bed nets mm -hmm. are not very useful, but certainly using B, but also equally important, I think it's, you know, it's amazing what long hands can do, because especially it is a gift that often feeds on your ankles and feet, so long hands um, and protecting yourself from uh, the other thing I would add is that if there's a fan on board, go where the fan is because mosquitoes don't like moving mm -hmm. wind. Um, so if you stay within the range of the fan, that will keep them largely at bay. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for people? Sometimes people have been told don't put DEET on children. What are you saying to them? Because I think a lot of these they're putting out there, they're saying they're okay. Are there changes? Have they? I mean, you would still argue, please do put one of those types of repellents. Yeah, absolutely, kids. and especially pregnant women can use yeah, it. Most so um, please don't. You know, people always say well, I don't want to do anything, but certainly in this case, uh, we would want to use uh, <coughs> repellent. 
Yeah, and I think it's also important not to panic. So mm -hmm. keep your risk in perspective. So for a normal, healthy person, this is a pretty mild infection. Most people are asymptomatic. Really, the concerns are if you're pregnant or if you unfortunately have to be one of those rare individuals where the virus can cause this rare neurological side effects. But in most people, this is a mild infection. And personally, I don't, you know, I often ask the question, should I travel? And, you know, we've already bought our tickets, we're going on vacation. So my, but I say it's really, if there's someone who's pregnant in your group, mm -hmm. I would strongly advise against traveling. If you're trying to get pregnant, uh, if you have sex, to have uh, uh, you know, used uh, contraceptives, mm -hmm. because what you don't want to do is to get pregnant in a setting where is it also true that it's very seasonal? I mean, that's one of the things they're saying about Rio, is this is not the season of mosquitoes in Rio, which doesn't mean there won't be any. But again, depending on where you're traveling, the time of year you travel really affects your likelihood of that sort of transmission. So that's another part of the right. travel yeah. advisories that you yeah. don't know. Rio, especially because it's so far south. But on the other hand, in Central and South America, mm -hmm. it's pretty much a clear yeah. because see, the seasons are less pronounced. Yes, question. Sure. Um, are there any established nanoparticle vaccines, and are they contraindicated in pregnancy? If so? Um, so there are no established nanoparticle vaccines that have been approved by the okay. uh, I would be very surprised if they would be contraindicated in pregnancy. Because one of the advantages of, of nanoparticles are, you know, they're not they're not directly derived from a killed organism, or they're not live. So those platforms would be ideal, but right now there are no nanoparticle vaccines for using that population. Yes. Uh, if you are infected with the Zika virus, do you build up any kind of immunities? Like for a, a, a young woman, if she has the Zika virus and then going forward, does that protect her at all through uh, a pregnancy down the road? Yes. So, you know, for Zika, I would be cautious about answering, but from what we know about this group of viruses, once you are infected, uh, you develop lifelong protection. You have very good immunity. You also very effectively clear the virus once you're infected. Um, now, there are some unknowns about Zika, especially in pregnant women. There's some data, both mainly more from animal studies, that the immune response during pregnancy might be different and there may be a harder time clearing the virus in the context of pregnancy. But it's an evolving situation. So, in general, yeah. Outside pregnancy, if you get infected, I would say that you, you, you develop an immune response that provides you with long-term protection. Um, that's most of an analogy to what we know about other vi related viruses. Anyone else? Yes, do you know, um, can it be transmitted via breast milk? And if so, would it have any effect? I know it's not like the same stage of brain, brain development, but would it have an effect on a growing? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is is that it, I think it's unknown for sure, uh, but that as a precaution, certainly we would work that into the same precautions we work in for blood and other things. And I would I would err on the side of going outside that window. But I think it's been too early to show that clinic. As an educational moment, this is really fascinating. When you look at the development, it was just a few months ago that people started understanding the real link with microcephaly. Then they found sexual transmission. Now they have this longer living in the semen. So this is really sort of an extraordinary moment when you know the public can actually see how, I mean, this is things working as fast as they possibly can because people are jumping on it so quickly. But it takes time, so you're asking such great questions, and in six months we might know a lot, maybe even three months a lot more. And the answer will probably come from here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Sir. Hi. Um, a woman that just came out of birth control, she's trying to get pregnant, but she needs to travel to South America, um, Mexico and Brazil, Cuba and Brazil, because of work. Um, for how long you would suggest for her to be safe and not try to have a baby so or start working on it? On birth control, she travels mm -hmm. and she comes back to the yes. U.S. and how long should she no, wait? We don't know if she will contract, but to be safe for her, for the baby, for how long should she wait until you start having 
uh, home protected sex. When she comes back to the US? Or She's coming she... back. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know the answer. It's a very important question, but I'm sure that uh, Dr. Andrews, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, it's on the CDC guidelines, and they push it out. First of all, we would strongly encourage, you know, we just want to make sure she's not pregnant when she goes. And so um, when she gets back, if you'll go to the CDC guidelines, they'll give you the window because, as the Chancellor said, 80% of people are asymptomatic. So, you know, your great concern would be that she would come back, uh, uh, have the virus, not know it, uh, and this has actually happened, you know, come back and within two weeks uh, of coming back, have intercourse and get pregnant. So we don't want, want that. And the CDC gives different guidelines. They go on their website and tell you explicitly for each of those conditions. If you're symptomatic, whether you're asymptomatic, where you were, and what your period of exposure was. And isn't it possible it might be different if it's the male or the female yes. because there's different. So these are really important questions that yeah. Yeah. really important to go to the guidelines. Yes, exactly. And the guidelines at this stage are basically good guesses. <laughs> we have been very cautious of a man I know. Uh, a man who uh, they're recommending six months after they come back that they use uh, condoms. That it's not because we know that the virus is there for six months and not after six months. I think that's just a conservative. Uh, uh, it's a great question because that was the first clue. There were two investigators who actually kind of discovered this out in Colorado. And one came back, and you can imagine, came back from a long trip. They uh, had intercourse, and she immediately became symptomatic. And that was the first clue in retrospect that, wait a minute, something's going on here. That was before it actually had been discovered. So it's a good question. Um, and that's the Joel's point that we, we, we keep pushing out our window how long it's present in spawn. Statistics are a little bit skewed. The number I've seen, and again, this is probably a really good guess, is about one in a hundred. But that would be incredibly dependent on when you were affected, whether it was the first trimester or the third trimester. The CDC shows two species of mosquitoes. What about that second one? Yeah, uh, the primary vector in, is uh, clearly Aedes aegypti, which we don't think in North Carolina we have huge clusters of because the Aedes albopictus, which was brought over in 1985 on tires coming from Asia, um, has crowded it out. It's just a better competitor in that environment. Uh, it is not the primary vector. We're certainly hoping it stays that way because we have a lot of Aedes al albopictus in this state, and not much we think of the Egypta. And of course, these patterns and change in temperature, all these are, are yep. all interrelated. And you know, we're, we're very lucky to be in this region where we have so many resources of great <coughs> universities, people with the expertise to really act quickly, a state with really close partnerships. But you know, it's wonderful when people come to events like this. We're really thrilled that everyone came. So I'm sort of trying to be very aware of people's times. So I think I can take one more question, then I'll make sure you get down there to have, or you can have more conversation and the ice cream before it melts. <laughs> somebody else. So um, there's one more yes. Um, after you were affected, you got better. How long is it before you're safe to get pregnant or have it? Do they have data on that yeah. yet? Uh -huh. Yeah, they do. It's in the CDC guidelines if you'll go to those, and it lays it out very explicitly. So my last question, who thinks it really should have been Dr. Zika? <laughs> <laughs>